making the case for who killed Christ. Now there are a lot of so-called defendants that we were going to put on trial today. There are the Jews. There were a lot of Jews. Was it all the Jews? Did it end up being just a few Jews? Or was it just the leaders of the Jews? Was it the Romans that were responsible? Was it specific Roman leaders? You know, political leaders? Or was it the, the centurions or the Roman soldiers who we can blame for it? Nonetheless, we're going to go through and make a case against or for each of these. Let's begin with the Jews in Matthew 26 verses 3 through 5. We see that they had it in for Christ. Again, he was uh, you know, obviously kind of stepping on their toes as they saw it and what he was doing, what he was saying, and they were obviously worried about their leadership and about them be continuing to be able to rule and them began being able to control the people that were quote unquote under them. And so Christ, as it were, became a thorn in their side. So they came to the point towards the end of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26 and beginning of verse 3, that this happened. The chief priests, the head ones, the scribes and the elders of the people, so these are the who's who of the, the leaders, the, the religious leaders of their day, assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, no, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And again, they were talking about the feast days that we are now keeping and that we are in the middle of. But it's interesting that they felt that they could take him by trickery. Nonetheless, that's what they were going to try to do. As much as they had tried it in the past, it never worked. I'm not sure why they thought, but they could do it again. But nonetheless, they're going to try this by hook or crook. They're not going to try to do this the legitimate way and know what they want to do. They want to kill him. And again, this was not an up and up type of uh, deal that they were trying to put together here because they were trying to kill him. They didn't have anything to do that with. So they're going to try to figure out some way to do it. And then we skip down to verse 55. And it says, in that hour, Jesus said to the multitude. So here we have the beginning of the implementation of it. And Christ speaking, have you come out? As against a robber, speaking about himself, is this is this the way that you guys are going to come at me? As like I'm a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching you in the temple, and you did not seize me. So here it is, they came in at night, under the cover of darkness as it were, and they arrested him. They had all this time and all this ample opportunity before to do it. But you see already the surreptitiousness of their plans. So they also, at this point, just arrest him. They didn't tell him why they're arresting him. You know, what was the charge? So they took him and arrested him without a charge. Why? Because there was nothing that he had done and said in all their previous encounters to give them cause to do this. Christ, as we know, lived a perfect life. And, you know, like Peter said, you know, deceit was not even found in his mouth, much less any of these other things. Now, let's turn over to John 18 and verse 12 through 14 to begin. John 18, and we'll be skipping around the Gospels quite a bit for this um, against the Jews, this case that we're making. John 18 verses 12 through 14. And what we're seeing here is that at every turn, what the Jews did was illegal in order to try to put their plan into motion, which was by trickery. It says, in the detachment of troops, the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him away to Annas first. Okay, again, this is at night. Now, Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now, it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now, what we have here is that they're taking him to Annas, who was a former high priest. He was not the sitting high priest, 
So he should have never have gone to Annas in the first place. Yet they bring him there, and they bring him at night. So what we have here is that, okay, th these things are happening in the middle of the night, which was illegal in and of itself, because when you had to bring somebody before the chief priest, the ones that were sitting at the Sanhedrin, it had to be between the morning and the evening sacrifice. So basically between uh, nine was about the time that they did the morning sacrifice. So after that, the Sanhedrin would sit. And then the evening sacrifice, which was probably around six. So they sat between those times. So here we are at night, they're bringing him to somebody that's not the high priest for a reason. They were still trying to get the goods on him. So it's like, well, we got, let's bring him to Annas, who really isn't the high priest yet, but he's kind of like one. He knows what we can do and what we should do. And he, if anybody, will be able to pull it out of Jesus because we still don't have a charge against Jesus. So let's bring him there. Now skip down to verse 19 to um, 24. It says, Then the high priest, they called him, then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. You know, I cry loud, spare not, and I, I told the world my gospel. I always taught in the synagogues, as was my custom. And in the temple, where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. Again, this was Christ's purpose anyway, right? He was to come and make these things known. So he didn't tell them in secret, he had a purpose. So, why do you ask me this? Ask those who have heard me what I have said to them. Indeed, they know what I've said. He said, there's nothing here that I really have to say that I haven't already said. So it's an obvious ploy by Annas at this point to try to find something, get that aha moment. Right? You ever been in a conversation with somebody like that? And you just you say something just slightly wrong, or the it's either the syntax or certain subtleties, and they just jump all over that. You know that's what he was waiting for. Annas was waiting for one little slip by Jesus. Why? So that they would actually have a crime to present before Caiaphas when they went, you know, quote unquote, to trial when it was supposed to be illegal. So basically, what we have is that Annas was on a, a fishing expedition, and he said, verse twenty-two. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, said, If I have spoken evil, which he hadn't, bear witness of the evil. You say, you tell me what it was that was evil, that was wrong, that was untoward, that was out of sorts. You tell me. But if well, if I said things correctly, if I said the truth, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, the Jews had a lot of rules, okay, that they are just pushing to the side. And these were rules, basically, that were to ensure that innocent men were not killed. So the Jews had all these rules, and I'm not even going to go through all of them, but they were not abiding even by those rules in this case because again like we started off they were on a mission to do this now turn over to mark 14 55 through 59 um well we'll read down to 65 mark 14 beginning in verse 55 so they don't have what they need to bring christ to trial so what do they do? I mean, again, these are the religious leaders with all that entails, meaning they're supposed to be the arbiters of what is good and evil for the people. And here's what they're doing. Verse 55, now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. So they're going around asking everybody, Please tell me, you know, something that we got on him. I mean, y'all heard stuff. You know, you, you came to us complaining in the past, right? And you said, "Hey, he said this or he said that," and but we know that the Pharisees say something different, and yet they couldn't find it. For many bore false witness against him. 
but their testimonies did not agree. So we were going to put the false witnesses as kind of like a subset of these defendants that we needed to look at, because maybe they were the ones that caused the death of Christ. But they couldn't even get their act together, because here they are, they're trying to come up with a good story, yet they couldn't get two of them to come up with the same exact story. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say. Now it was close to what he said, but not what exactly he said. And they took it out of context and said, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But even on something that he had purported to say, and he said something close to that, they couldn't even get their testimony to agree because that's not what he said, right? You can go look at the scripture later to see all the, the differences in what he said. And of course, he was referring to himself and not the actual temple anyway. So they needed, these chief priests and council and everyone, they needed at least two of these guys to say the same exact thing. And they could not even find that. So still, not only do they not have a charge, they don't even have an accusation that they can rail against him. Now, verse 61 says, he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? So are you the one who is coming to save us? Are you that foreshadowed, that, that prophesied Messiah that is come, the son of God? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. He's saying, I am the Son of God, and that I will be sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And what do you think that made them say? I mean, they already had their, their mind made up on who he was. He was just the son of a carpenter who had these delusions of grandeur. Well, verse 63, the high priest tore off his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death because he had blasphemed and called himself the son of God and that he would be with God. So now the interesting thing is that this actually wouldn't have even been illegal under their law. Right? You could not incriminate yourself in that way unless you actually had more people that would testify to that fact. So Christ, by their law, and again, we, we talk about pleading the fifth here, they could not incriminate themselves. So it would somebody else would have to come along and say, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Definitely, he's the son of God. What kind of position would that have put them in? Anybody who's testifying that would also then, quote unquote, be guilty of blasphemy or would have to at least going, be going against their own belief system. So, again, the point is, is that they were not allowed to even use that against him. But nonetheless, we're going to sweep that under the rug and keep on moving out. And then verse 65, some begin to spit on him, to blindfold him, to beat him, and to say to him, prophesy, and the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. So even this type of treatment was illegal. They were not allowed, even if you were on death row, to violate the person in this way. So they continued in this illegal manner, this illegal trial, all the way through. Now, John 18, verse 29, it's early morning, and they're taking Jesus from Caiaphas, the high priest, to the Praetorium, which is the Hall of Judgment, where Pontius Pilate sits. John 18, in verse 29. So they're finished. They're, they're trying to, they finally figure out they got a charge here that they can, you know, this is the best that they can do. They're going to have to make it work. And again, they're going to do whatever it takes to make it work. And so John 18, verse 29, he says, Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? Now, they still didn't have a legitimate one to bring to a Roman authority. So all this, all that they had at this point was what? It was blasphemy, which was a religious issue. So if it was a religious issue, 
Pilate would not have had any jurisdiction over it. And they knew that, and so they're not going to bring that up to Pilate whenever you know he asks, you know, what's the accusation? They can't tell him because he would have just, as it were, pushed it back down to the lower courts or to the, in other words, the Jewish religious courts for them to handle. But that wasn't going to work because, again, they're between a rock and a hard place as it is. Then verse 30, they answered to him, these the Jews, and they said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. Doesn't that make sense, Pontius Pilate? Again, are they not being very careful? They knew what was up. They knew that they could not bring that accusation. So again, they tried to cover it up and push it before him. <clears throat> and Pilate said to them, you take him, because they didn't come at him with a legitimate charge. It was this nebulous type of thing that would be thrown out of court. And he says, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And so now here their real motive actually comes to light. Again, they said this from the beginning, but now it's out there. We want to kill him. That's why we're bringing him to you because we can't do it. You know, we're under the Roman authority right now here in Jerusalem. And so you're going to have to be the one who does it. Now, Pilate interrogates him, and then he comes to the following conclusion in verse 38. Okay, and he comes to this conclusion because, again, looking at the merits of the case, he had no agenda, so he had no reason to come to any other conclusion. Verse 38, Pilate said to him, to Christ, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But that wasn't good enough for the Jews, as you can imagine. So Pilate then kind of says, okay, I know what, I, I got a good idea. I can send Jesus to Herod. And the Jews are all for that because Herod was much more ruthless than Pilate. So Pilate was hoping that he could just be done with the matter and by putting it into Herod's court. Luke 23 verses 8 through 25. Luke 23, beginning in verse 8. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him. And he hoped to see some miracle done by him. So it's like he's what a court jester, a court magician or something. But no, Christ wasn't going to have any of that. Verse 9. Then he questioned him with many words, and he, Christ, answered him nothing. The chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. You can imagine all the vile things that they were saying. And yet, nothing stuck or could stick. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him, Christ, with contempt and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity or enemies with each other. Now back to Pilate. When he called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, so it's back in Pilate's court again, he said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed... Having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him. Indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. So even the ruthless Herod and, the, and Pilate could not come up with anything to appease the Jews which were under them. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city for murder. So again, they were more willing to let this man go than Christ, who they could find nothing against. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him. 
crucify him. This is what the Jews are calling for. This is what they want. This is what they've been working towards this whole time. Then he said to them a third time. Okay, how much more clear does it need to be here from Pilate to the Jews? Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Again, he's trying to sell him on it. He said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priest prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. So it was the Jews. They had finally gotten what they wanted. You know, they got this sentence. It's what they had been pushing for and demanding this whole time. And then finally, in Matthew 27, 24, and 25, Matthew 27, verses 24 and 25. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying I am innocent of the blood of this just person so he's washing the blood from his hands symbolically you see to it and all the people answered and said his blood be on us and on our children he's saying they are saying the Jews are saying we take responsibility for Jesus's death for everything that has transpired even though it all be illegal they're not saying that out loud but they're saying give us what we want we want death and so his blood was on them and on their children again scary words to utter and to mention to say at a time like that now acts 3 verses 12 through 15 we see that Peter confirms. Again, we're building this case against the Jews for being the killers of Christ. And we see that Peter confirms it. All right, so we have a witness, another witness against them. Acts 3, verses 12 through 15. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Men of Israel, why do you marvel? And again, where's the context here? We are in just the, uh, the chapter right after the uh, day of Pentecost when many were converted and Peter gave his sermon and uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out among them. And he goes, men of Israel, so for context, who's he talking to? Why do you marvel at this or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness that we made this man walk after this, this healing? Verse 13 says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus whom you, men of Israel, delivered up and denied Christ in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One, the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed, or murdered, as it were, the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. So again, here it is, Peter, witness number one. Witness number two, Paul, confirms that the Jews did it in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 and 15. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 and 15. First Thessalonians 2 verse 14 for you brethren became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus for you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Judeans 
who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and do not please God and are contrary to all men. So here we have Paul, another witness, saying, yes, it was the Judeans, the men of Judah, who killed both, who killed the Lord Jesus Christ. So, again, a very, very strong case to be made against the Jews, that they were the ones that killed Christ. But let's not stop there. Let's look at the Romans. Turn back to Matthew 27, verse 26. Let's look at Pilate here in this. Pilate being the Roman procurator, the one that was the arbiter, the one who had the power to say yes or no, who came to the Jews, who three times said, I don't have any fault with him, yet he delivered the sentence against Christ. Matthew 27, verse 26 it says, Then he released Barabbas to them when he scourged Jesus, again for no reason, hoping to appease the Jews. He, Pilate, delivered him to be crucified. Okay, well, now we have a case to be made against Pilate. Pilate actually had the power to stop this from happening. He had that authority, I should say. So was washing his hands enough? I mean, it's a symbolic washing, right? Where he said, okay, there, I, I'm not guilty of it. But yet, what did he do? What didn't he do? He could have put his foot down. He kind of half-heartedly tried to do it, right? But he, again, being a politician, he didn't want trouble from Caesar. He'd already get, gotten in trouble with Caesar once before when he mixed the blood of the Galileans with the Jewish sacrifices. So, again, I guess he got his hand smacked for that. And as this Roman procurator, you want to be seen as being able to handle and take care of what has been put within your jurisdiction. So here he is. He doesn't want the Jews to have this uprising. Otherwise, you know, Caesar's going to say, okay, maybe we need to get another man for the job. And even the Jews even threatened him kind of in that way, saying, well, look, he says he's king he wants to be king. He's going to become king. Isn't that in direct opposition to what you know Caesar wants, what Caesar is? This man's raising himself up to be in competition with Caesar. And so they try to influence him that way. And again, obviously, a lot of these things impacted. But Pilate had his wife tell him, don't be involved with this. I have had a dream. And it was a very troubling dream saying, you know, this is what's going on. You can't be a part of it. So Pilate had all these things. He had that authority, the ability. What he lacked at that point in time was the character to do it. And because he did not stand up, Christ was killed. So there's a very good case to be made against Pilate as a Roman. But we have other Romans. What about the Roman centurions? John 19, verses 32 through 34. The Romans then carried out this sentence in the typical fashion. Right? What did they do? Along with the other things that we've already talked about in terms of beating him, punching him, scourging him. There was the crown of thorns that they put on him. There was the crucifixion. Again, they were the ones that were doing this. Putting him on there, putting the nails through his wrist, and standing him up. And then finally, John 19, 32, the soldiers came up and broke the legs of the first, and the other was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead and did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. <clears throat> and again, this verse, when you, you know, don't want to get into all the, the technicalities of it, is probably better rendered, but one of, the, one of the soldiers had pierced his side. So if you combine this with Matthew 27, verses 49 and 50, you can come to the conclusion, plus looking at the, the case of the, the Greek here, that it was actually before he died, and there's other technical evidence that shows that after you're dead, you know, the heart stops beating and these things aren't going to happen as they did. But it goes hand in hand with him crying out, his, that loud cry that he did in Matthew 27, where, 
again, he then gave up his spirit. But nonetheless, again, it's pretty well accepted that he was indeed uh, killed by the soldier with the spear who stuck it, thrust it up, apparently under his rib cage, into his heart, and blood and water came out. Again, there's no doubt about that. Okay, that, that then he screamed and cried and gave up the spirit and died. So should it be against all the Roman the military that enforced? You know, they didn't have to do that. Right? I mean, there would have been penalties for it, of course. But nonetheless, and even some of them said later that he had no fault. That Christ was unjustly crucified and put to death. Yet, here's this soldier who pierced his side. A very good case could be made for making him the one who actually killed Christ. Because if he had not done that, maybe there was a chance. Now, verse 36 and 37 we see that prophecy was fulfilled because of some of these things that happened that we just read. It said, For these things were done that the scripture should, not, should be fulfilled, not one of his legs broken. So they came and they would break the legs, kind of hurry up the process because it was a slow suffocation by hanging by your, your arms that it would constrict you in such a way your muscles would give out that you would eventually suffocate to death. And so they'd break the bones so they couldn't support themselves with the legs and it would speed up the process. But they didn't do it because Christ was dead. And then another scripture says, they shall look upon him who they pierced. Again, this was fulfilled in doing that. So now what we are coming to see is that actually many people were complicit in this death. They were accomplices to this wrongdoing. Let's look at Acts 4 verses 26 and 27 and 28. Acts 4 verse 26 and 27 first. We see that there were many people to blame for the death of Christ. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. So you see this list of people that are now being thrown in together as perpetrators of this gross injustice against Christ. But now we see who really made this happen in verse 28. These people did what? They were gathered together to do whatever your hand, and it's a capital Y in mine, speaking of God, whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So, again, he's saying that it was because of God and Christ that this happened, that Christ died. The Jews and the Romans and all these other people that have been mentioned and all the ones who may have had a hand in it were merely instruments in the death of Christ. Let's turn over to John 10, verses 17 and 18, and we'll see who truly was responsible for the death of Christ. John 10, verses 17 and 18. This is Christ speaking. He says, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life... Right? This is what he's doing. This is what we've been talking about. That I may take it again. No one takes it from me. Not Jew. Not Roman. Not Gentile. Not political leader. Whether king or procurator. 
or religious leader, scribe and Pharisee, chief priests, elders. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself of my free will. I have power to lay it down. I have that ability that no one can usurp in this respect. And I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So think about it. Christ on earth, he was God who divested himself and became flesh, even said while he was on earth, I can call legions of angels to come and do my bidding. How then could these Roman centurions, this weak need Roman procurator, these Jewish scribes and Pharisees who hid behind their authority, how could they come and take it if he did not allow it, if he did not want them to? Again, rhetorical question. Of course they couldn't. And so, again, he says, no one takes it from me. I lay it down myself after talking it over with my father. And of course, we have God, his father, in heaven. In all his power and glory, who with, I won't even say a flick of the wrist, a flick of the thoughts, as it were, could wipe everything out, could hold these men back from doing what they did. How could they do the things that they did if God did not allow them to it? Now, as I said, these two planned this. God the Father and the Son put together this incredible, awesome, loving plan. And it was a part of the plan from the very beginning. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 20. First Peter 1, verses 18 through 20. First Peter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by the traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's how you were redeemed, how you were bought back. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, those leprous spots, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest to you in these last times. This was a plan that the two of them had put together from the beginning that these things would have to come to pass. Matthew 26, let's go back to verse 54. We read 55. Matthew 26, verse 54. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? And then Christ says, Are you coming against me as a robber? Can you not seize me before? Verse 56. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. The disciples left. They were no help in that. And so, you know, when they could have and should have been there, still... They couldn't have done it, just as a side note. But the point is, is that the scripture showed it. So it was foreordained before the creation of this world. And it was according to the prophecies of the prophets. In fact, let's look at that in Isaiah 53 and verse 10. Isaiah 53 and verse 10. And we see Isaiah prophesying it. So again, this is you know, 700 years before Christ came. 
said that this, this had to happen. It was completely within their control. It was a part of their plan, being God the Father and the Son. Isaiah 53 and verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, was, he has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So it was God who put this, and it was God who was overseeing this, while the other member of his family was in flesh on the earth. He was seeing to it, making these things happen. But why, though, did they have to happen? And we come now to the real committer of the crime. The reason that God the Father and the Son had to do this was because all mankind is responsible for the death of Christ. Not just the Jews, not just the Romans, not just the people of their time, but all mankind. Let's go back up to verse 4 in Isaiah. And we see why Christ had to come and do this. Because of our sinful nature and that the penalty of our sins, which is death, he had to pay in order that the plan of God could be fulfilled and continue on. Verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, so again, once again, it shows God doing this and afflicted or God allowing it. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, our sins. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him, on the one who is coming as Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8 he says, For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. So we're back to where it is. We're seeing this now in context of why God and Christ had to do this. Why it was part of the plan. And it, part of the plan was that they came up with it and Christ was the one, the son, who was going to come down and he willingly, nobody took it from him, he willingly gave up his life for every one of us. Because every one of us have sinned. 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. Again, you can, if you want in your spare time, finish reading Isaiah 53 because it, it goes on and just repeats that point that he came for us, for our sins. 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for our sins. Okay, that's why he came. He died for our sins, the just, that's being Christ, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. He came to die for the unjust. Who are the unjust? Who are the sinners, the transgressors, these people who work iniquity? What does Romans 6.23 and 3.23 say? The wages of sin are death, and all have sinned right, and deserve this. This is what we deserve as a sinner. Because everyone has sinned, everyone is unjust. Christ came for everyone, and everyone is responsible, therefore, for his death. 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. Christ had to die to pay 
for our sins, the sins of humanity. 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. And this, the love of God, and again, this was a plan of love, was manifested toward us that God, here's how it was manifested, here's how he manifested his love, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Christ had to die for each one of us individually. He became that substitutionary sacrifice. He's the one that paid the penalty in our stead so that we did not have to pay this death penalty from which we would not come back unless Christ had paid it for us. So we, brethren, are all responsible. Had Christ come at any other time in any other culture, they would have really have treated him the same way. Think about it. I mean, if Christ would have come as a Muslim, what we know about Muslims, they would not have put up with the things that he had said from the beginning. Well, they, they would have beheaded him, right? Now, don't misunderstand. Christ had to come when he did and where he did to fill certain pro prophecies. But nonetheless, the point is, is that had he been with anybody else, okay, Jews, Romans, had he come in this age, how would Christ be accepted? You know, well, we have a very good idea. Christ coming, preaching the Old Testament laws, as well as expanding and expounding our understanding on them in the New Testament. Who believes that today? That's, again, that's the stuff of nut jobs. And people are very quick to point that out. Oh, you're, you know, you're weird. You're wacky. You're a sect, a cult. He would not have been accepted. In 1 Timothy 1.13, he says, Although I was formerly a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent man, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. That's the way these people did it, the Jews and the Romans of their time. They did not know what they were doing. Right? Christ and God had a plan that they knew what was happening, what was going. So all the blame does not go on to them because of their unbelief and their unknowingness and unawareness. They were ignorant as we once were ignorant. So the question is, would we really have done any better had we been there? Odds are that we would not have, that we would have left his side, that we would not have been there to testify for him, that we would have been one of the ones spitting on him, that we would have denied him, or we would have punched him in the face, or scourged him, or beaten him. We would have been the ones putting the crown of thorns on his head or the nails in his wrist. We would have hung him on the tree and we would have stuck the spear in his side and we ultimately would have betrayed him with a kiss. We are guilty of his death, but because of it, we can be forgiven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved and that's every one of us